Hey there, my name is Sam Brace, and I am the Senior Director of Customer Education and Community at Cloudinary, and you are watching and listening to Dev Jams. This is where we talk with developers who are doing amazing, interesting, innovative, inspiring projects, especially when it comes to working with images and videos on the web, in software, on mobile, and many other amazing projects. And because, of course, I work at Cloudinary, the program is produced by those at Cloudinary, they probably are using Cloudinary for some of those image and video management and delivery aspects of their projects. In today's live stream and episode, we are talking with a good friend of mine, Ben Seymour. Ben, for full disclosure, actually did work for Cloudinary for a portion of time, but has been for a while now, the Director of Sales Engineering at Vercel. And Vercel, if you haven't encountered them, they're an amazing platform, especially for front-end developers. And we'll walk through all the details about what Vercel does, especially in this program. But he has an amazing set of projects that he's going to be able to show with today when it comes to being able to create image galleries very quickly on the fly with inf information coming from Cloudinary, particularly with the images that are coming from a Cloudinary account. And then we're going to dive deeply into a topic called Open Graph which is, of course, a type of metadata that is used by social networks like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, as well as what we call microbrowsers, such as services like Slack, to be able to display images that are associated with a certain URL. We're going to dive into a lot of different ways that is making that easy to work with, and of course, in conjunction with Cloudinary. Before we bring Ben on to the episode, I do want to emphasize that if you, this is your first time ever being part of a Dev Jams episode, note that we have all of our previous episodes at cloudinary.com slash podcasts. That's where you can go through the entire archive and find any episodes that tickle your fancy when it comes to details about JavaScript or Next.js or just working with images and videos and working with webhooks and metadata and all sorts of things that are associated with that. There's a lot of amazing content that's inside of our overall podcast feed because we've been doing this for about two to three years now. So it's a pretty impressive amount of content that we have in the library. And we do also want to emphasize that if you want to continue the conversations that Ben and I are going to be having in this overall episode, many of the concepts are things that our users talk about daily on inside of our Cloudinary community. You can find that at community.cloudinary.com. And as you'll also see, we do have an associated Discord server for those that would prefer to talk in Discord versus our forums, or maybe both. It gives you lots of different opportunities to be able to start conversations and meet users like you. So as we said, Ben does work for Vercel. And I also emphasize front-end development. It's an amazing platform for all the things that you need to do when you're working in this overall space. But of course, we're going to dive into two specific types of projects, image galleries and open graph. So. With that said, I'm going to bring my screen down and bring on Ben, and welcome to the program, Ben. Amazing. Hey, Sam. Wonderful to be talking to you again. Uh, just like good old times. It is. Uh, so, hey, um, hey, everybody. Uh, ben Seymour, based in the UK, not far from Oxford, a uh, sleepy little town, very cute place, founded in 1155. Great to live unless you like nightlife and food to be delivered to your house or the ability to catch a train or a train. There we go. Um, I ultimately with, uh, live with uh, my wife, our two kids who are 16 and 13, and our little dog, Senna. And uh, as you probably gather, I like things to do with physics, space, and also fast moving things with two or four wheels. Um, by day, I work for Vassell, who also love speed in terms of web performance, but also uh, developer iteration speed as well. Um, so the self mission, I think, is, is there's many missions in here, but one of them that I love is uh, to, to enable developers to create at uh, the moment of inspiration. I think capturing that spirit, that flow state is something that I've always loved in terms of like my work in this industry. Um, and then one of our other mantras is that iteration velocity solves most problems, um, which, uh, I think is one of these things where when you're in the groove, almost anything is possible, uh, outside of it, added friction, added frustrations is, is, is deeply annoying. Um, in terms of the rest of the team, um, I'm very, very fortunate to work with some remarkable people. So we are massively open source, uh. The people who work at Vercel are involved in all these projects. So Tobias uh, created Webpack. Uh, he's currently working on the latest version called TurboPack with more of the team. Uh, Rich, who made Svelte, is here. Jared and Turbo Repo. Um, some amazing projects, all massively open source, huge numbers of downloads, and it's something that we massively pride ourselves in contributing towards the, the, the overall community. So 
Um, lots more to say, but probably not today. In terms of our story, so um, what do you think, Sam? Shall I move on to the conference? Should we get started? Yeah, let's talk about this conference that you guys did with the NextJS. Perfect. So this was uh, October of last year, um, and effectively it is it is by, by Vassal all about Next.js in this case. So really, it is run on the platform. We build the, the uh, everything, conferencing facilities, we look after everything, but it's fundamentally not about the sale per se, but about Next.js specifically, what one of our open source projects. Um, in this particular instance, we had 110,000 people sign up to watch it, 55,000 people watched it online. And if you look at the kind of follow-on views, that they're pretty impressive. Um, in this one, we talked about a variety of things being released. Uh, one of them was this thing called Edge Functions, which at that time was in beta. This is actually quite important to what we're going to talk about in terms of open graph, because we leverage this under the covers to allow certain things to be very capable. Um, it was a hybrid event. Uh, it was actually the first time we've done a hybrid event. So uh, it, it was fairly small. We had a few hundred people in San Francisco, also in New York. Um, we also had one in London and also Sydney. Um, but one of the joys we did is that we took lots of photographs of the day to capture the fact that lots of people got to meet each other for the first time. So we are a remote first company, but also we're a member of, of a very large community of people, many of whom had also not seen each other for a long time. So lots of friends came, lots of people from across the industry came, and we made this rather splendid and glorious image gallery that came out of it. Um, it's very, very hard to run a performance test while we're live on air, but effectively this is uh, an incognito tab. And if all goes well, um, you'll notice that was staggeringly fast. We'll share the link at another time, but ultimately it is one of the fastest Frankly, media rich, one of the fastest loading sites I've ever seen. Um, the general interaction, oops, I did my mistake. Uh, the general interaction with everything you do is incredibly fast. Now, behind the scenes of all this, just like Sam said earlier, um, there's fundamentally a lot of collaboration going on and a lot of mixed JS with the cell going on. But one thing that we're massively fond of doing is also is uh, sharing what we've learned. So Hassan, who works on that main project for the gallery, also wrote an extensive blog going into all the little details that he did, some fascinating stuff that he did along with some of the engineering teams um, in the ways that we were using effectively the Cloudry's APIs uh, alongside some of our data loading properties to allow us to leverage, I suppose, the best power of all worlds. Mm -hmm. um, there's some tips and tricks he gave down that I'd never seen done before that were quite amazing. Um, there's some of his suggestions are to do with um, things like having a, having a zero transform 3D, uh, which ultimately forces hardware acceleration where it's available to you. So little tricks like that, that in effect, it looks like it shouldn't do anything, but behind the scenes, it does some fairly subtle things. Um, also amazing things about this is if you notice, there is a clone and deploy button. So another thing that we love to do is somebody wants to, uh, again, learn at the point of inspiration is that if this looks cool, you can read the blog and you can literally hit clone and effectively you can in about three clicks have a version of this fully running on on your own local host or also uh, on your own Vassal account um if you take one of our uh, other templates so if you go to vassal.com slash templates this is where effectively you have a huge list of starter kits and by no means is it only next.js you will find most frameworks because we are also framework agnostic you'll find lots of partnerships and effectively if you search it here for cloudry then you will find, uh, there you go, that one there, which is one that we're also talking about. So again, getting going super quick. This is one that I was considering doing live on air, but frankly, take my word for it, the whole thing was deployed in 46 seconds. So I think one of the things that often I am looking for, like many developers is, if I wanna go and learn something, how much time do I need to invest in this? Can I make progress in an hour, a day, a week? How long do I need to go and do this before I can actually show that there is some value coming out of it? Our goal is to make that, frankly, seconds and minutes more than anything else. So really incredible. And, and, and what I love about what we've done here is that we've combined, as you said, best of breed, where we have all of this amazing big technology that Russell went and did, but it's not where you went and tried to reinvent the wheel with image delivery, image management. You're able to combine two distinctly different technologies and bring them together for this one project. And it's something where I was interestingly showing this to our events team that ran our user summit back in London a few weeks ago now, and they were saying, oh, we need to do this for all of our events. So it's to say like, this is an easy to use tool that any team can absolutely adopt. So great work by the Marcel team to be able to make this possible. Perfect, perfect. Um, I, think, I think that bit where the two worlds meet is probably uh, most salient if I come down to here. So really, um, within Next.js, uh, and ultimately this is using, um, there's a new version of Next.js uh, that went into uh, stable release last week using a thing called app router. This one is actually based on pages. 
So in this instance, we're going to do um, a single set of data fetching uh, within Next.js. Get static props is effectively a way of saying we would like to pre-build this page or build the page at a certain moment in time. So you can have versions where you do effectively what is server-side loading. Every request goes and makes something happen on a server. That typically has some kind of performance impact that is rarely good for user experience, but it can help greatly with things like personalization uh, and a few other things. In this instance, we've got an option within Next.js. Get static props says, I'm going to go and effectively pre-build all of the pages, a bit like static site generation um, that I'll need in order to then serve what is effectively static pages out onto the web. But there's a couple of small twists into that. Uh, one of them is, is that you can choose to do only a small subsection. So imagine if I'm a massive news and media company and I've got a million assets in CloudRate, maybe I've got yeah, 10,000 collections. Building all of those is going to take a long amount of time. So what you can do within here is you can actually say, build certain of the collections, but not the others. Uh, the rest can be generated at request time. And after that point will be then served as though that they were fully static objects. Uh, in this particular instance, you can see that ultimately I'm using the, uh, there you go, there's the cloud research. Yep. Uh, I'm using a variety of things that are passing into environment variables, just like you would do. So mostly my credentials, my, my authentication is done behind there, but I also do certain types of um, kind of configuration against the actual media that we're going to serve in here. So in this instance, we're going against a given specific folder. We could have done tags. We could have done any other piece of metadata. And then effectively, we're going to say to Cloudry by the APIs, please give us all the information that is relevant to this particular query. Uh, if you can just see in the terminal at the bottom, I hope that that's big enough. This is really the response that comes back. So the JSON response comes back. Um, and ultimately, this one is bringing us about, uh, what is that, about 111 items, I think it was just in there. So again, I'm making the API request. This could be done at build time. Uh, or also, in this instance, another interesting thing happens, which is I've added a single line, which completely changes certain elements of the information architecture. So this single line revalidate, uh, effectively uh, 3,600, which is one hour in seconds. What this says is this page is going to be classed as static. So from a performance perspective, this is a really static file served by globally deployed CDNs. But the revalidate effectively says, but every hour, we're going to check to see if there's updates. This is highly cool. configurable. What it means is you do your event, and on day two, you want to do the next one. Effectively, you're not going to have to rebuild everything from scratch, but you will find, pick up those kind of those changeable aspects. If that makes sense. Sorry, Sam, I think you were going to ask me something. No, I, I wasn't. Gonna, I was just saying that that's a very, very smart one line of code. Because as you said, it, it, we're, one thing that we push a lot in training is kind of being able to set it and forget it, to say like, get your system to be able to work for you, set up automations, let Cloudinary do its work with automatic transformations. And this is an example of that, where you can easily say, just revalidate, and it's going to continue to make sure that whatever you're adding to this folder is going to make sure it's updated to what's showing in this overall app. So this is fantastic. Uh, you mentioned webhooks earlier. It's one of the other things that you talk about. So we can also do think of on-demand uh, for okay. revalidation, which only is, as long as you've got a slightly more complex system, which is going to trigger an event, we can then catch that and do the invalidation on, on, on request as well, if you like. So lots of options. Um, next one I was going to do is, so this thing here is using an environment variable. Uh, I'm just going to manually overwrite it. Um, and if you look on the left, so effectively, there you go. So what just happened is in my local environment, I have literally made one change. This has then regenerated this particular page. It's changed the request in the way it's gone out to cloud. Cloud has come back with an entirely different set of media and everything else is then built on demand. Um, I think it's remarkable how quickly you can affect change. If I roll this one back to just as it was, and again, hit save, um, there are certain things within, I suppose, the next JS and uh, development environments that are pretty much instantaneous. We have a hot module reloading. So if I change that title at the top there and then hit save, you'll instantly see it. In this instance, we're of course making a change that triggers an API request, mm -hmm. which then comes back. Hence, even what you're seeing there is the full round trip and then all the media also being uh, loaded. Another cool thing, this is something that uh, I go create, not create it. Uh, there we go. There you go. So in, in this version, effectively what I've got in is I've said, this time, please can Cloudry give me the JSON response back for all the media that matches my query, but please can I do it in descending order, really reverse order by the created app. So this is literally the reverse order timeline. So this is the most recent photograph, most recently. Um, this project actually is slightly more complicated, which is it's actually uh, my Instagram feed. Um, and as you probably gathered, I, I'm very fortunate. I got to go and spend a couple of weeks in Iceland very recently. This is actually me setting up uh, a slightly more complex workflow, which was 
There is a Zapier integration running with my Cloudly account, which effectively is looking for changes in there. It's then doing an automatic import into my Cloudly account, doing a bit of tagging, doing some object aware um, uh, 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 a AI analysis as well. And then this allows me to effectively keep almost like an owned media version of my social media as well, just to give me lots more choices. And things. Which is incredible. And, and, and we're seeing even more people doing this. Like we had previous episodes where people did something very similar, where they're trying to get everything to come from your Instagram account because of unreliability they found sometimes with their APIs. So it's it, what you're demonstrating is not like edge case by any means. And we're seeing more and more developers trying to own their Instagram content and put it into somewhere a little bit more safe or just at least more reliable. So it, it, and this is cool. Uh, the other wonderful thing is set it and forget it is I'd actually forgotten I'd set this up until I came to do this project. I went to go and set it up and found that effectively my, my, my cloud account was already still running on the old Zapier that I'd set quite some time ago. Very nice. Um, so the next thing I was going to talk about, so this is all, um, really local. This is me working my machine, uh, rapid iterations, trying lots of stuff, seeing what the outcomes are like, making sure that. Each, I suppose, each use case fits. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be certain things in here that, you know, if we look at, again, you might look at how we handle different aspect ratio, ratios of images, it does a pretty good job. Um, but having done my local work, I suppose the next thing that simply want to do is we want to open this to more people. So this is me going into my Cloudry dashboard and my, sorry, my Vassell dashboard and my account. Uh, and ultimately, this is me um, finding what's called um, my, 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 my deployment pipelines. So these are all of the bills that I've been doing. And as you can see kind of in the run up to this webinar, I did a few double checks of a few things over here. Uh, I did a few redeployments, a few status changes, a few config changes. This is every deployment that I've done against my account, but not just the live production work, but also the preview, what's called a preview deployment. So if you see here, preview, uh, what this actually means is that I did a branch on the code. So locally right. I branched, in this case, it's called Iceland, it was for that trip that I just mentioned about. Um, and effectively, having done a branch and then worked off that uh, on that branch, as soon as I start to do commits against it, my Vassell account picks this up, realizes it's not a production deployment. It then spools up an entire preview deployment, which allows me to do things like share this with somebody like Sam, who can then come in and inspect it without making any changes to production. Uh, it gives me a couple of other really nice handy things as well, which is I can have environment specific um, uh, environment variables. So if you saw earlier, sorry, let me just mute when I cough. If you saw earlier, uh, I made that change locally. Mm -hmm. In this instance, this is me doing it via envir environment variables on the platform. So I can take a fork of my code. I can come up with another edge case. I can have a preview deployment. And then effectively I can say, Hey, but let's try in a different configuration. And what you get out the other end is effectively a live running version of that same thing we saw earlier, but it's not going to affect the production. So it's a live oh, preview cool. deployment that frankly, to all intents and purposes could be used live if we so wished. The other thing that is pretty cool is if you see here, effectively, we've also got DNS settings. So within my account, what I've said is, um, look for the branch called Iceland and set a subdomain against only that branch. Obviously it can be called whatever you like. So in this instance, if I'm working in a bigger team, we can already know in advance what the end state URL is going to be that everybody can then run tests again, if that makes sense. You can either have these against, uh, against things like, um, the, uh, the, the Git project name. So that's also predictable further in time, uh, or you can have it against kind of manually created ones. So if you want to share with your QA team, they will know in advance where it's going to be. And then it's just a question of orchestrating. Um, I don't think we have time today, but there's some other cool stuff that we can also do, which allows actually, um, other elements of feedback, which is. This preview deployment also includes the ability to annotate. So effectively, anybody coming in here could start to add in things to passing comments back to the team. So phase one is rapid iteration locally. Phase two is sharing with a bigger team. Phase three is getting feedback from the rest of the team. And it does things like that. It goes into your, your, your linear, uh, linear boards as well, if that makes sense. So this one, I think, is all about the iteration speed of the team. Uh, and that's pretty important. Truly right. incredible. And the thing that I love that we've done here to take a little bit of a cloudier angle on it as well is that many times when people see that search API that you're using, they think of it strictly as a way to go and pull a list, but they don't necessarily always think about it as a way to pull a list that's going to be driving delivery. And the fact that you're able to do it this way to say that we're calling this, we're getting the list of 150 results from that folder and then deploying that into this gallery, that's a really cool use case for the search API. So I think that there's a lot of amazing things here, but I'm, I'm, I'm blown away. Wonderful. 
uh, in a way, this kind of brings us to the start, actually. Yep. So the reason that you and I got in touch again um, was that I shared that project that we just looked at. Uh, I shared that into LinkedIn. This is the actual post. And ultimately, I think you spotted this and saw that I was doing some stuff with Open Graph, and that was kind of how the rest of this all started. So this is the Open Graph image, which I set up on that project. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is what Open Graph is, how to use it, and also some of the ways in which eventually Vassell, Next.js, and I have can combine to give some incredible capabilities. Um, if you share that same post, so if you were to drop diamond.photos uh, into Slack, you get something like this. Obviously, this one is me dropping that link into, uh, into LinkedIn. Um, interestingly, when I did a reshare of the post that Sam did for this webinar, uh, it actually accidentally inadvertently gave us an example of what does, what, what <laughs> something that isn't good looks like. I'm trying to avoid saying bad, but really what, what bad looks like. So within post resharing within LinkedIn, it doesn't allow you to have control over your own open graph. Now, I would argue that frankly, a big blue box doesn't really do a great deal to entice you in compared to what you can do from an open graph perspective. So. Um, this is a protocol, uh, it, it is available if only it's, it's just to be the attributes that go into the head of your, of your HTML by and large. Um, there are some fundamentals that you should always try and have things like title and types so that type could be videos or images. Um, if it is an image, then you want to share a URL to the image. So in the case of the one that we saw a moment ago, the image that was shared effectively here is a completely different image. It's one that you would never see on the web page itself. So if you scroll up and down in here, at no point will you see that image. It is within inside the head, so it's within the side of the right. metadata of the page. It's only used by other systems or other services or other processes. Um, we worked with Colin for a while, uh, and ultimately Colin did amazing posts on this as well. So it's also called micro browsers, or it can also be called link unfurling sometimes as well. But the protocol behind all of it is ultimately uh, Open Graph. So um, my intention is that I think Sam and I are going to find a way to share some links with everybody afterwards, but some great resources. Uh, in this case, by Colin. There's also one by one of your colleagues, uh, Colby. Yep. Um, tons here to be researched into. Frankly, it isn't just what we're talking about today. Today is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot in there that you want to consider from uh, customer acquisition, from uh, social engagement, from SEO. There's a lot of business benefits to be explored. Um, the final thing in this sequence is um, I actually was using Cloud and Re in one of my other projects. So I have a storytelling platform that I've been building for a while. And ultimately, behind the scenes, I was using, before you and I met each other the first time, I was actually using CloudWare to do some very complex mini, uh, image manipulation. So ultimately, within inside the page itself, there's like nine different images. They're all completely independent. And as you can see, they are varying aspect ratios. Okay. Um, some of them are quite wide. Some of them actually, both of those happen to be quite wide. But there we go. Some of them are more square. Behind the scenes, what I did with Cloudry was, and you can see it just here, it's actually, it's a fairly complex command. It's a multi-layered command. It's ultimately, I'm taking a variety of different aspect ratio source assets, and I'm doing intelligent cropping on each one, and then I'm doing a complex layering sequence to make this single. So this is a single composite image, which is effectively built from nine other images. I think the most important thing to mention about the open graph thing a moment ago is effectively, you get one image. What you do with it is very much based on the tooling that you have. So in this instance, you can obviously argue that Cloudry allows me to do remarkable levels of image manipulation. But the end result, this is just a single image request. And that's the power where Open Graph gives you one reference, but what you can do with it is quite remarkable. Well, and it's interesting because like Open Graph is something that I've been talking about. I feel like I've talked about for like 10 years now. Like it may be a, a little bit off, maybe it's more like nine or but. But it's, it's something where this isn't necessarily new technology that we're talking about here. This is something that I remember when we were teaching people about just running their websites back in like 2014, 2013, and we're teaching them about this new thing that is coming from Facebook, now Meta, and talking about open graph protocols. And this is a way to make sure that you can start affecting the way that your metadata looks on social websites like Twitter and LinkedIn. And, and so it's, Something where it's interesting that it's still so powerful, but in my opinion, it's still something that people are trying to wrap their heads around. Because as you pointed out, many times when we are writing this new blog post or issuing a new project, we don't always think about the ways that people discover it on social media or discover it, as you mentioned, for search engine optimization purposes. So there's a lot of deep, deep power with being able to just start thinking about open graph and what it means for your project that you're trying to share with somebody because pictures get people excited. 
and they get people to click through and that should ultimately help in open rates and time on site and all the things that people care about when it comes to analytics. So I think what we're going to be covering here about how this is all done is vitally important for anybody that's just trying to be able to get people to know about the work that they're doing because Open Graph is a great, great tool for that. I think the other thing that's changed over those 10 years, while the protocol has pretty much stayed the same, is that social media has really dramatically changed in the last decade. Yeah. But I think the way that we use our phones and the way that we use various platforms, I think this is the fundamentally different thing where, you know, th th this is a massive change. If you look at the viewing stats between devices 10 years ago, you know, 2014 to 2024, um, yeah, it's going to be quite another, a, a big change when you look at it. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, this was, um, last year, uh, where effectively we announced a new iteration of a project that we already had. And by we, I mean Vassal and by we, I mean people who are far smarter than me, uh, Stephen and Chu and, and variety of other people in the engineering team. So we originally had, and this is what this blog post talks about. We originally had, um, effectively, um, a different architecture. It was using a totally different build system. It was ultimately running on something that's a bit more like a Lambda, like a serverless function. Um, it had various consequences, like maybe slow cold boot times, um, a, a variety of, a, a variety of weight in the complexity of the library and the environment was being run in led to an amazingly powerful solution, but which compared to what we released at the very end of last year actually was quite slow in comparison, I suppose. A nicer way is to say that the new version is significantly faster, significantly more performant to the point where, um, it, it's, I, I think, I think what you can see that it's, it's, it's effectively, I think it was like 50% faster, even from a from a warm start. And if it was versus a cold start, then it was kind of a greater magnitude. So you can see that side there it is just there. So it was taking maybe four seconds to generate one of these. The modern version is taking like hundreds of milliseconds, uh, no more than that. There's also a variety of other things that's also happened in the way that we re-platformed is effectively we're now using a fairly um, far less expensive compute, which means that you can start to consider doing something like a hundred thousand of these and not be that concerned about the cost that you'd have. If you scroll down to the bottom of this one again, we'll share the links later, is that actually for that conference we mentioned earlier, we actually did custom OG images for every single person who signed a ticket. So we made over a hundred thousand of these using the same technology, every single one personalized, obviously from our perspective, we wanted this to be something that was then shared socially on Twitter, everything else to also gain traction and also to gain everything else. So this was the digital equivalent of, uh, this thing here that I'm holding up to the camera. So early. we also had the people at the, the, the in-person event. This is the digital version of that. And it went down very well. This also massively helped with certain levels of engagement. People wanted to share it. People then were curious. Some people wanted to know how on earth we've done it. Other people want to know more about the conference. So there's a lot going on behind the scenes. Part of the thing that greatly helped this become feasible is I mentioned that in that, in that October event, um, we, we, we talked about going into a, into a beta release. We also now at the point where this, this thing called an edge function is effectively, uh, is now a GA. Um, and this was just at the tail end of last year, which opens up a lot of different possibilities. So this gives us effectively a lightweight edge runtime, no cold starts, but the bit that also I think gives it a really interesting dimension is that it supports web assembly. So you can take things written in C or Rust, and you can effectively start to combine all of those, and then run them in this same environment, which is why, um, yeah, again, we, we've been able to get some pretty phenomenal outputs from it. So our general approach is, uh, tons of documentation. Uh, obviously we try and give as many examples as is possible. Our goal is obviously to help everybody get hands on as quickly as possible to learn as quickly as possible. Uh, there's always a playground because not everybody likes to read documentation, but I think the other bits I also love is that we're, we're massively open source. So effectively this is open source and public. So you can see you know, plenty of forks, plenty of stars. And then the other bit is if you want to go and get hands on, you can just come here and you can grab off one of our repos, a ton of existing examples that you can probably copy and paste as the start as to what you do next. Um, one thing that's actually, really like, cool about this that, and I wanted to see what you thought about it. So we, when we've talked about open graph with other projects in the past that developers have done. A lot of times they're using systems like Puppeteer, serverless functions that are associated with that. Maybe Playwright is another one that I've seen come up that's kind of the same idea as Puppeteer. But what, it, talking about advantages and disadvantages, to me, this seemed like a much more scalable option. Like the example you showed of the Next.js open graph that you had for the conference is that if you have to create a ton of OG content quickly, this seems to be able to generate that much faster than constantly having to spin everything up from the cold boot, everything that you have from just like basically spinning the whole browser to be able to just handle this thing. Um, but 
talk to me about that because I, I feel like I don't fully understand like I, the, the competitive aspect of that. I I, th I think you've nailed the core cool points there. Oh. So effectively, this is this is a review of the old system that had okay. been built by the team three or four years ago compared to the new version. So the old version was using Chromium in a serverless function. The new version effectively uh, doesn't require even a headless browser. So we're doing it a lot a lot closer to native, which obviously gives you um, it, effectively it's far faster and far cheaper and far quicker. So in uh, you know it's normally like you know what is it uh, chick uh, far, fast good or quick or whatever it is pick pick two. I think we just went for all of them from outside. Yeah, you kind of so, did. I agree. So we kind of we kind of just went for everything. Why choose two two when you can have the entire lot? So this is ultimately, um, again, Sartori itself is open source. You can grab it. If you really want to, you can go and try and understand it yourself. We have then ultimately implemented this as kind of a core primitive within side of the kind of the cell ecosystem of self platform and Next.js as a framework as well. So you can, by all means, go and you know, follow, follow your own path. Obviously, you know, we, we, we think we've done a pretty good job and you can probably save an awful lot of time by using ours, but we also know that people like to go and noodle around for themselves as well. So, um, yeah, uh, you know, they kind of earlier massively fast, much, uh, much cheaper and, uh, a much more performant to get those first responses back as well. Um, what I did then is I actually grabbed some of those examples, uh, just to show a few running ones. Should I have a quick wander through these? Yeah, absolutely. I would love to see some of this. Uh, smashing. So this is, uh. Yeah, uh, as you can see, this is a, a fairly simple little bit of code. Um, ultimately, I literally just grabbed one of them. Interestingly, initially, I should have updated these. So uh, I mentioned earlier that this this uh, this edge is now uh, it's now in stable release. Okay. Some of these code examples when I first made them, which is, it was the tail end of last year, actually we're still using that version. So I could come back and make this stable these days without using the experimental version. Um, one of the glorious things is from a front end perspective, if you imagine. Um, we built a website. It's mostly front end skills that have gone into that. Obviously, people who know, you know, HTML, CSS, probably Tailwind these days, uh, a variety of things in JavaScript, maybe using Next.js or anything that you like. And yet, when it comes to the OG image, the kind of tooling in many cases for a lot of people um, might well be doing something, uh, you know, like cloud manipulation. But a lot of people that I met with were generally building something in Photoshop. Yeah, and then kind of doing an export as a static object, and then trying to put that somewhere it could be pointed at. I think that step between modern front end and Photoshop, and I used to work at Adobe, and I, and I love Photoshop, but it's not by any means the same skill set or the same workflow or the same process. In this sense, the the joyful thing is that we're using HTML and CSS tailwinds to effectively determine what the layout looks like. So the exact same people who are building the front end experience are going to be really familiar with how all this works. So hopefully HTML, CSS, image references can come in. What comes out the other end is this is what's produced. This is hopefully just an image. So you get an image response back. This is me using uh, this one up here, the, uh, the cell OG library. Um, that's pretty much it, actually. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of a try catches for errors, but this is all you need to do to start your image generation process. Now, what I do as I wander through this next thing is this one here was hard coded, which obviously doesn't exactly scale. So in the second one, I just chuck a bit of stuff in that says, really go and have a look at this query strings. If, if there's a query string parameter in the right name, then let's start using that to dynamically change things. This is where it's going to get slightly tricky with a smaller screen. But in here, this is literally me saying, you know, break free from your constraints. Whatever we put into here will then be dynamically generated at request time. So this is how you can imagine you can start to do very dynamic generation of everything. So you could have one of these automatically generated for every single blog post that you ever do. Um, and it supports multilingual. So you could have one of these for every blog post that you ever do in the right language for the region where you're going to serve it into. So this becomes immensely powerful. You can start to kind of, you can kind of hear, start to couple up your content management system, uh, your some head headless CMSs into your production systems as well. So I think this is tremendously powerful. Um, next step in here was, let's bring that one back over to here. Finally, next step is let's use some custom typefaces. Mm -hmm. So between these two here, you'll notice it's starting to look a lot better. Bit of typography goes a long, long way. So at this point, I'm making a reference to some true type. You can also do WAF. Um, we've also got some other very interesting font optimizations for your live website, but, but that's for another time. So in here, I'm pulling in font file references. So if you happen to be the kind of business that has your own custom font, which you, do. Higher, yeah. you can then start to make references here. Other than this, check the licensing on your typefaces. 
Um, I'm also doing a little bit where I'm starting to do some tweaks to things like the background color. So if you ever look at my blog, there's a certain color palette that I use in my blog. So this is where I'm starting to make this a little bit more customized. I'm using, uh, you know, better typography. In the next instance, I just wanted to show, you know, again, it might only be a, oops, come on, there we go. Might only be a uh, single media reference, but this is actually the media reference I showed you earlier. So the fact that Cloudry is taking all of this and is doing the, the nine image optimization, cropping, manipulation, compositing, and serving means that that single image reference is remarkably powerful. So this is where I think you really start to combine both worlds. Um, if I'd have needed to build effectively uh, a different a, a different setup with inside of this uh, this HTML to handle all of that, it would have been a lot more complex. So I think this is a great place where the two worlds really, really work very, very nicely together with each other. Um, and the next example uh, is probably this one that it's kind of one of those that started it. So this is where I grabbed an asset. Um, I was experimenting with different color palettes. And I just wanted to very, very quickly effectively reverse this. So what it looks like if you invert all of the colors effectively, and this is where I hit a snag, which thankfully, um, again, with, with Cloudry in my back pocket, allowed me to fix it. So ultimately, um, this is the before and after. So if I do nothing to that image, which effectively was a black line art that was on a transparent background, it's actually mm -hmm. an SVG as it turns out. And if you know things like sanitize, so one of the great things about SVG, um, is it's immensely powerful. One of the bad things about SVG is it's immensely powerful. You can hide just about anything in it. Um, one of my favorite, favorite simple commands within cloud is you can sanitize the SVGs to make them really safe to reuse elsewhere. I actually was converting it, background removing it, and also allowing myself to do things like uh, color change. So if I come over to here, and then there we go. So this is, I think, a pretty beautiful outcome that would have been really hard to do without the combination of both those technologies. There's so many good things that are I'm sure you're showing here, because one, one showing the overlay situation that you're able to create with the benign picture grid that you had there, it does show really great use cases to be able to say, if I want to take this image and that image and the other one and combine them to create this open graph image or just anything with being able to combine this into one piece of content. Clannery can do that with overlays. So I love that L underscore usage and being able to manipulate where the X and Y coordinates are and create that beautiful grid. But this is also very impressive, what you've gotten shown here with the overall picture that we was, uh, you know, basically bat black against a black background because, again, this is showing the ability to colorize, being able to do all of this on the fly, but also programmatically, because let's say that you have this happening across 50 open graph images. This is where, thanks to what Purcell's doing, you can scale that. But also you can simply apply some of these parameters into the overall images and you can have them now immediately all affected where back to previous software that we mentioned, it was where that's not as easy to automate. You would have to go in and manipulate each single image, do an upload, be able to then pass this into a place where it, so it's just, this is a very simple approach to being able to handle something that's very complex. And I, I really love these overall demonstrations you've created here. I do have a few more if you've got a bit more time. I would love, I love demonstrations. Keep it going. Keep it going. Um, so this one is kind of, again, riffing on the theme you saw earlier. Uh, I'm not going to show the code. I think you can, I think most people kind of figure what's going on behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to show the cloud re commands that I use behind them. So this is where we kind of started. The idea is we start with a single image, you know, right. so it's a glorious image that I, uh, yeah, I found somewhere. Um, the limit with this is effectively. It's a big rectangle. It's a big rectangle with a certain shade of blue and you know, the, the subject in question is the turtle, obviously. Um, but one of the things I really love is this command here. So I use Cloudly's background removal in this instance. So this is me taking that same image. I'm not doing anything to it, frankly. All I did was add another command and then Cloudly does it for me. And then I can start to do little bits of tweaks. So this is where I can start to take that existing initial media and I can start to experiment with it. I can start to break it free from those foundations of being in that, putting it in a big rectangle. I can now make it feel like it's a part of the rest of everything else. It doesn't feel like text next to an image anymore. It feels like one item being drawn next to each other. Yeah. And then can do other treatments. If I want to experiment with color palettes, this is grayscaling. Um, final one for this sequence is one that is frankly one again, one of my hugely favorite things, which is um, Cloudry has um, uh, colorblind assist effectively. So it's this command up here. So if you imagine the kind of work that you end up doing as a front-end web designer in terms of color contrast, when you're thinking of accessibility from, from a visual standpoint, this is the treatment that allows you to do something very, very similar to your images. 
as well. Oh, very few people, I think, actually remember to do about this. So if you look very closely, where you can see, and I've done it on the black and white ones to make it slightly more obvious, is effectively it's overlying overlaying lattices where yeah. the color contrast is different in the image. So if you were somebody who had a colorblind uh, weakness, you may not see those boundaries. And this lattice just means you can more easily start to see the definition of it. Uh, this is one of those things where I wish more people would consider doing this. Um, I, I, I have four brothers and two of them are colorblind and they really struggle. Uh, it means I get to win at snooker slightly more easily. But other than that, it, other than that it's, it's handless. Oh, I love it. But no, but you're absolutely right. And that's a wonderful thing about being able to have all of these thousands of transformation opportunities is that if you want to be able to say, I need this to be grayscale or if I need to just flip the image, once again, you don't have to be going into separate software to do it. It's just changing the URL or changing the, the overall parameters you're calling for that image. So it's, it's simple and it, it shows a lot of the power that Cloudinary is providing to be able to create these open graph images. So I think these are excellent examples. Okay. I already think I know you well enough to, that you're going to quite like this one as well. So this one is, um, if you ignore the crudity of the mockup, but hopefully this is a Photoshop file. So we said earlier, this is where a lot of people start their work, especially on the creative side of things. Um, behind the scenes, this is a Photoshop file. If I was to change this to be PSD, uh, ultimately, um, yeah, it's, it's not going to load because browsers don't support them. It's going to offer to me to try and download it at the end of the day. It probably is going to be I don't know, 10 meg, 20 meg. I've seen, I've seen Photoshop files that were 50 plus meg. So the original asset in here is a very common protocol. Photoshop files, PSD files, ignore the design. That's, that's just me. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a designer unsurprisingly. So the original file is how many, many creative teams work, but it's in a format that really isn't particularly helpful for the web industry at large. Uh, the joyful thing here is eventually I can just drop a different file extension. Badly does that change for me. Um, another thing that I really love, uh, is. This is where I can reference different layers. So I can actually say which layers within the Photoshop file to turn on and off. Um, and then I can start to do extraction. So it's a bit like that background removal from earlier, but it's also a completely different work workflow because this starts with a multi-layered composite that's probably had a lot of care and attention paid to it. And in the end, it allows me to take the same asset and to reuse it. The investment typically from creative teams in making these assets in the first place, the photography, the photo shoot, the touching up later on to be able to repurpose subsections of that in every other format. I think this is rather, rather wonderful. It um, is. So again, it's, it's a different use case, but it's a very different part of the business that I think we can then start to work more closely with. Well, and I think you said it well, I think the, the fact that with Cloudinary, you can be able to change really any format into another format. And I mean, I can't think of a, a reason why I'd want to change a PNG to a PSD, but in most cases you would want it to go PSD and PNG as you're showing or to WebP or JPEG or something along those lines, but being able to expose details based on clipping paths, based on layers, that's something where it's very helpful because you can give your creative team the ability to say, put your file in as is. You don't have to optimize it. You don't have to export for web, export for screens, give it to me as is. And then as a developer, you can go and create any type of output off of it, including as we're showing here, open graph content. So this is fantastic. Okay. I have one last thing. Oh gosh, um, let's, let's see it. I would love to see it. <laughs> there we go. One last thing. And um, we were quite fortunate here because frankly, this only got released like two weeks ago. Um, so ultimately you can imagine doing your local testing. Um, mm -hmm. you can imagine dropping into your own WhatsApp and having a look at what comes out the other end. But one of the things that we always want to know is what's this going to look like to our own customers. So about two weeks ago, if you come into your, um, dashboard. Yeah, and this is what you saw earlier. So this is a variety of the releases that I've been doing on this particular account. If you come into any one of these, including the preview deployments, we now have a new tab called Open Graph. Now, ultimately what this does is this is, there we go. So even against what is eventually a branch, so it's an experimental release potentially, this is me and uh, being in a position to see what would this look like to a Twitter user? So it's all well and good. I was thinking it's good, but me, I'll see what it looks like on Slack or on Facebook or LinkedIn. Uh, I think it's immensely powerful. It also gives more of a breakdown for more of the aspects within the open graph protocol. And it also very helpfully tells us when we've maybe forgotten something. So in this case, I forgot to put really the URL reference to the canon canonical link into it. So I think it's a great way of verifying that what is about to go out the door is what we hope it's going to be. So rather than having to do again, that round tripping, there were, there were a few other validators that were sometimes workable. Frankly, they would tend to be a bit hit and miss. Uh, there was like a, a validator on. Twitter.dev or dev.twitter.com 
but this gives all of these in one place straight into your project. And it also allows you to really run experiments, do a branch, run an experiment, have a look at this straight in the same place. And then let's face it, what you hopefully want to go and do is, you know, if, if you're very happy with, with the results, you could literally then come along and have this as part of your deployment step. So in some cases, this might be the way you go, we're now happy that even the OG image is ready. Let's promote this up in production, something like that. When the key thing I think that you said to me that I was like, oh, yeah, that's why this matters is that it's about things that are not in production yet. These are things that will be in production. And a lot of these testers that I have found when it comes to open graph, it's a way to validate something that it's already been pushed live because they're able to scrape the URL. And this is where, based on what you're showing here, this is something where it's not deployed yet. And you're still able to test a lot of these various aspects against the way that these services like Twitter and Slack would interpret the open graph data that you're giving to this before everything's published, everything's live, people can see it. And that way you're not having to retroactively say like, oops, we made a mistake. You can check literally everything about the deployment before you deploy. So this is a really big win in my opinion. Perfect. Um... I think we've kind of covered everything that I had in mind. Uh, again, the, the, the potential I think is limitless. That thing at the beginning, you know, which is our goal is to, to help, uh, help developers to create at the point of inspiration. I think there is so much that you could do here. I, I think it's like, sort of, it's a massively, if we just look at this one segment of what you can do in terms of the way that your business, your project is, is expressed. Um, I cheated by the way. So for the, how to contact me. The easiest way for me was actually, was to actually use one of these tools very, very quickly to chuck it up there. Yeah, this, this to me is quicker than frankly, opening the slides tool and adding it in there in many cases. Um, so I think, I think that created the point of inspiration, experiment, local iterations, the faster you can move, the faster you can find what works, and what doesn't work, the faster you can get feedback, the faster you can do that next cycle. Um, I think this is the way that we, we ultimately find, find our organizational and our team health, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, let's face it. If, if I think of the number of changes that have happened in our industry in we talked about in the last 10 years in terms of you know, the, the growth of mobile and social to all intents and purposes. But I, I think kind of 2020 through to 2022, obviously, um, there were a lot of health challenges that caused a lot of the biggest changes to all of our everyday lives. The ability to develop it, to be able to go and figure out how on earth to help their business survive in that environment. I think that's something that, that we can both greatly help lots of people with and hopefully help them be very successful and their business is healthy as well as they go. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, and I think the biggest takeaways I'm seeing here is that one, the image gallery situation that you went and showed, to me, it has a, so much applicability to, I would say, lots of different businesses. Because with the example that you gave, that it makes perfect sense. You were trying to do a summary of content that happened around an event, which was Next.js. Next but I could also even see this applied for e-commerce purposes, where if I'm trying to show a collection of all of the shirts that we're going to be debuting and have that where now I have a developer say, just point to this folder and now we can display all this and then give this out to the media or to our agency and they can be able to see all of this. It, it kind of, it's ways to take a lot of the concepts that Cloudinary has done with collections, but make sure that they're being able to show hundreds of them and also in this nice gallery format. So it's one way to take additional steps forward with that. So I think there's, if, if I was watching this, even if I wasn't a developer, I would be able to see there's a lot of use case behind that image gallery that someone can bring into the business today um, with the two businesses, of course, helping along the way. So the, the thing that if you ever invite me back, the thing I'd like to talk about next time is that effectively um, the, the latest version of Next.js went into stable last week. Okay. Um, and it allows us to have, so in the version we looked at earlier, it was at the page level data fetching. The latest version, which is called the app router effectively allows us to have, um, independent components within a page, each of them doing their own independent data fetching. So oh, what I showed true. you earlier was this page, let's refresh this page every hour, whatever it was. In this instance, we can say, you know, the top section, the, 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 the nav and the footer will not change, uh, or at least will not change for a long time. And you can then have independent boundaries. This is all off the back of a uh, thing called React Server Components that came mm -hmm. out from okay. React 18. This allows us to have completely independent pockets or components, or you might want to say composable architectures, which would allow us to probably take everything we've just seen right now, but make it effectively at the, at the component level. So now we can start to have everything we've just seen, but as being a subsection of your page and then reused across different pages as well. 
So I think this is where I imagine we'll find that a, a lot of uh, a lot of traction is found. I think. Oh so. yeah, because now if you think about it, like you could have multiple galleries, if I'm understanding that correctly, and then it's where you can if, if so many brands have these brand portals or they have these like media rooms where we could say here's a picture of all of our CEOs and here's all of our brand assets and then here's like our re press releases all that stuff if you had them where we're individual pieces and you're all able to say point to this folder point to that folder point to the other folder and it just keeps getting updated that's huge and that gives people an immediately developer friendly media portal that they can work off of then that's pretty slick I, I, I love the idea and we got, we have got a minute left of me. So I love the idea of e-commerce website, uh, a PDP per detail page. There's a component lower down, which is like the product in use, which effectively is customer uploaded via a load of the cloud tools with auto moderation turned on, that then allows us to fully streamline the entire that workflow, which then would couple in with the kind of, um, the, the automatic recognition tools to then allow us to go, this component should be anything that has been tagged as being suitable and on brand of the right product, and then it gets pulled in. So your product in use is effectively almost like able to update kind of day to day as people post things onto social media, or if it's a big event, uh, obviously we, we, uh, we had a big event in the UK a couple of days ago, uh, and lots of people wore interesting clothes. This is the kind of event that then gets a lot of media attention. If you have to be a brand that is trying to probably, uh, relate in that world. Having those very up-to-date components of products and use or, you know, social usage, I think is massively difficult to do without the right tooling, uh, but also massively powerful as well. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think the other big thing that I'm standing out to, and it's not the first time we've ever said it, but it's where I think the way that it's been positioned in this episode is that when you're thinking about a project and releasing it truly, like, what are all the components of this? One thing that development teams should be asking for and seeing how they can help with is open graph is before we push this thing live before people are going to start consuming this do we have open graph content for it and i think with the power that Vercel's developed with all the og image generation it makes it that that's something that actually happens it's not where you now have to go off to a creative team you have to go off to somewhere else and say go make this for us and bring it back or you just bring through the header of the post which sometimes is not correct so it's to say no, we're going to create new, unique content, but it makes sure it happens with every deployment. So I think that's really big. And it's something that I hope more that are tied to product deployment start thinking about as this is a necessary component of the process and the project. So this is my blue sky email, Twitter. Yeah. Um, do we have a way of getting links out to people? So can, yeah, can we so do follow ones? Great question. So, and it's a great segue, Ben. Because at the very end of this episode, of course, we'll always be able to release this out to the various networks that we happen to be on. So that's going to be on YouTube, Spotify, Cat Cloud Near Academy, of course, other places. And we'll always include deep show notes. So that way, all the links of things that I've referenced and Ben have referenced, they'll all be available. And that's a great way for me to bring it back to be able to explain that all of that, of course, is on our cloudinary.com slash podcasts page. So as you can see, looking at a previous episode where friends Amy and James from Compress.fm podcast, you'll see that we have lists of all the places where you can reference the details. We have full transcripts of all of that. And one thing, I don't know if Ben, you've seen this, but I, I love showing this off, is that these are all little JavaScript calls. So if I click onto this, it'll actually jump you to that particular minute mark of the episode. So if you're seeing something like, when did they talk about that? It'll go straight to that portion. So lots of nice little usability details that we have when it comes to um, the ways that these podcasts are debuted. But yes, all links will be available once this is live past the live stream. So, so I would say this was good. So Ben, thank you for being part of this program. <laughs> and of course, we've given lots of people lots of ways to communicate with you, whether it's through your email, whether it's through your Twitter account. And of course, you're very active on LinkedIn as well. Um, is there any other places where people can communicate with you? I know that you have a really nice personal page. Is that one that was mentioned on that? Um, the, OG the, that you have? The, the resource at bencima.com as well. But, um, but yeah, lots of places there. Um, but yeah, but for everything else, we'll share the links. Obviously, um, there's me personally. There's also Marcel. There's obviously an entire team that will help answer any of the questions that we have. 
Um, and if, and if it turns out that we need to get other people involved, we can always, uh, get either the DevRel team involved or some of the community people more as well. Amazing. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, Ben, it's been such a pleasure to have you here and thanks again for being a part of this and for everybody that's watching and listening. Thank you for participating and enjoying this program from Cloudinary. And we hope to see you watching, listening to future episodes of DevJams. So take care and we'll see you soon. Thank you all.